Hello, and welcome to Flicks in a Six. I'm one of your hosts, Anthony Costanzo, with me, forever and always, the man, the myth, the TS Mother of an A, Alessandro Bielsi. Uh, the what now? <laughs> the TS Mother of an A. I'm not entirely sure I know what that is. Uh, oh, oh, oh. It's, a, it's a, a little preview of today's episode. Uh, <laughs> on this week's episode, Animated Media, Ready Player One, some Star Wars news, all before we dive into our flick of the week, Get Out. But first, Al, what are we drinking? Sorry, I was distracted a little while you were reading the rundown because I was following the instructions. I was following the instructions on that beer, which said to pour hard and then admire and enjoy. Yep. Because we're drinking Left Hand Brewing's Wake Up Dead Nitro Russian Imperial Stout. And one of the cool things about the whole nitro thing as opposed to carbon dioxide is um, that they have the much smaller bubbles, which make for a more velvety mouthfeel. Um, and the bubbling... Is cool. Sorry. I uh, this is a, a preview of a future episode, but that is definitely a thing I'm going to call you. At some point. <laughs> That's the least surprising, <laughs> the least surprising thing you could say. Are you going to call me the mil- the velvety mafia? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, I was. Uh, I, I don't know if you, if you noticed in that in that little uh, clip of the opening, I was pouring very hard. That's what it. It actually sounds like I might drop a beer <laughs> upside down, but uh, it's it came out just right. I did just the right. same thing. I just inverted it and just let it splash down into the glass. I yeah. also have, uh, and I'm drinking it out of a step mug, which is nice. Exactly what it's supposed to be doing. But uh, you can even see like the the head on the beer looks creamy, and that's from two things. One from the nitro, and two from the fact that this has flaked oatmeal, which is used for head retention and for mouthfeel purposes of beer, and a little bit of flavor as well, but it has more physical aspects on the beer than anything. In fact, the ingredients say Rocky Mountain water, malted barley, flaked oats, hops, and yeast. Interesting. It's brewed on the banks of the mighty St. Vrain River, super smooth trifecta of cocoa, dried fruit, and licorice notes, 10.2% 10.2% alcohol by volume. I'm sorry, licorice notes. I thought you said licorice goats, and that was concerning. There are, in fact, licorice goats Moving. in this beer. Moving on. Let's take a sip of this, and then yes. we'll talk about this beer. Please. Please. Cheers. Oh, boy. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's nice. Yeah, I thought oh. you might like this one. Velvety mouthfeel, indeed. Right? Yeah, that's a. Uh, oh, that's delicious. That's yeah. like. It's almost uh, like dessert. Yeah, but not. But like, but rarely when I have a beer that I would describe that way, I would drink more than one of them in a row, and I could see myself drinking a couple of these. Well, the thing is, it's not like a kitschy one that's like, oh, this has got like s'more beer. Right, or right. This tastes like I'm eating a s'more. <laughs> So, um, this is the Wake Up Dead Nitro. To make Wake Up Dead mega smooth, we snuck in nitrogen. Poured hard, this beast of a black beer emerges into a smooth companion with velvety chocolate cake aromas and the perfect flavor trifecta of cocoa, dried fruit, and licorice. Oh, man. Don't let the initial sweetness fool you. This beer will tumble around your taste buds before collapsing down the back of your throat with hops and some mysterious ABV. (laughs) Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I want like these people some of these folks definitely have like a really good time writing these things but I've told you that for the longest time since we've been doing the show and even since before that that's like like if I won the lottery and didn't have to work I would just sell my services to any like whiskey or craft beer place that needed descriptions of their beer written because right. those guys sound like they're having a time of their life they, and I feel like seriously I can do are. something of that so Let's uh, let's talk about label art here for a second. Uh, very, s- very, yeah, which I love, and it's like really nice type typeface. But the uh, there's just something I don't know what it is, but there's something really nice about this little little gradient design. It's just very very subtle. And then their 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 logo also <laughs> just just a hand, which I love that just the left hand. But this little guy on the bottom is really where I want to focus. There's this little skull, skull but. Quite, quite the space for a brain in there. <laughs> Which, I, there's something distorted about it, but it's just really silly to me. And like this whole thing is looks really elegant, and then that is just funny. It's funny the, the <laughs> upper jaw and the eye holes of the skull are reminiscent of kind of that 
particular art style you see with like the Mexican Day of the Dead mariachi yeah. type of thing. Mm -hmm. But the top part of the skull is reminiscent of Mars Indiana Jones and in the Crystal Skull. <laughs> Also, also, I don't remember. I don't know if you remember Scary Movie three that well. Ooh, I'm not sure. So the Wake Up Dead thing is the whole conversation between Kevin Hart and Anthony Anderson, where they talk about how do you go to bed dead and wake up alive. There's this whole stupid argument that they have. I definitely don't remember that. <laughs> and it's 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 kind of entertaining <laughs> about it it. whether or not one a person who goes to they said, oh, did you hear about whatever the guy's name was? Yeah, the other day they found out he woke up dead. He said, well, how are you going to wake up dead? <laughs> <laughs> it took this whole conversation of, That's you know, great. He goes, how are you going to go to bed dead? That shit's redundant. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Th uh, this is, I really like this. This is this is going to make a, a second appearance in my life. Not on the show. We don't repeat beers. Uh, <laughs> we, we might. At some point we probably will. Because what's going to happen is, I, one, we're, we're not like, I don't, we don't have like a checkboard. I mean, you can go back through our notes and see what you put down for the beers, but I have a hard enough time with this one note opening. It's almost as if we've gotten so many sessions into this thing that it's just not loading anymore. So we might have to find a new tool. Well, did you notice I went in because it was starting to piss me off? Because I noticed you, like a couple sessions ago, started putting the titles of the movies alongside the session number. Yeah. So I went back and I did all of those the other day. Oh, did you really? Yeah. Hang on. Because... It was starting to drive me nuts, too, because I went to look back for something, and I couldn't find it. That's great. I couldn't find it, so I was like, this has got to end now. I, I got to go back and fix all of this. Um, but remember, you and me have also talked for a while now about potentially doing an untapped account for the show's beers. Yeah. And that's the way that we would be able to keep track of all of them. Yeah, for sure. We should... We could uh, we could definitely do my yay or nay in there as part of the yeah. review, but uh, this is an absolute yay. I'm very very happy with this one. We're gonna yeah, I'm enjoying this beer uh, considerably. This is good. I mean, this I don't. I, this is really silly. I, I'm I'm being weird about this, but the, there's something about the about this label that I really like. Yeah, you are being really silly because it is as simplistic a label as you can have. But that that makes me happy. I mean, no, don't get me wrong. It's effective. It's just. It's weird how caught up you are in it because there is so much going on. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. Anyway, it's as wonderful as this beer is. Uh, so our first topic for the show is animated media. And the reason I bring this up is I listening to a couple of podcasts lately and then um, started watching Star Wars Rebels, which I know you'll appreciate. I do. It just um, ended this week. I know, which is why it's... it's Bitter, bittersweet ending. It's the perfect but, time for me to jump in because I don't have to stop. I could watch it at my own pace knowing that I'm never going to hit a wall where I'm going to have to wait for episodes to come out. And I really, really like that. Correct. Uh, but the in the podcast that I were listening to, it was folks were talking about uh, the art style of video games and how when things looked cartoony or like non-realistic graphics, they, it, it turns off a huge set of audience members. Yep. They're, that, they're not that's probably true. They're not into that. And I remember being that way at one point. But I, uh, as, I, as I think more into it and I, I start playing a lot of these different games, there's, like everything else, there's, a real, there's good ways of doing this and there's bad ways. And you can, I think it, it's a hard thing to do to, I feel like, to completely capture like your imagination and get you focused on the story and not like, and, and get you immersed in it with, an animated art style there's you have a harder you have a it's a harder job for for the art directors to do that and for the designers to do that and this became clear to me while i was watching rebels the other day because normally uh the first my first reaction to an animated series is i'm gonna have to pick up the right time for me to start watching this to see if i'm gonna be able to get through it because i know that there's gonna be certain times where like i want to focus like, be invested in the story, but something about the animated style is going to take me out of it. Okay. Um, what about it? Is it just the differences in different people's animations, or is it the fact that there's an automatic uh, ingrained connotation with animation as being childlike? I think it's the fact that I've... I feel like it started there, like, the, with the, the fact of it being childlike. But that's no longer the case for me. Now, and that because I've, I've been exposed to a lot more that is... That, that takes the childlike aspect out of it. like Because I'll be honest, society itself is getting better about that due to the rise of stuff like 
South Park and the yeah. Family Guy and then Archer uh, tackling adult themes and adult, you know, content with animated. Well, and I, I think that's that's part of it too. So I've never had a hard time watching something that was animated that was meant to be funny. I I think I associate it with being happy and laughing and not being serious. So it's taking something seriously, like not taking it seriously yeah. from I have to pay attention or embrace what it's doing, but serious content and themes being delivered animated. Right. And that was always that was always odd to me and I I couldn't I couldn't grasp it. And then I think I don't know that it was uh that I just started to click with me or I finally saw something where it worked and I was like, "Oh." And then I started to see more things where it worked and I was like, "Oh." <laughs> like I really really like this. So, the, one of the first things that I saw that really stuck with me um I had seen a few things here and there before, but it was the uh, the Dark Knight animated movies. And I loved those comics. And then, which is, it's funny to, to think that I loved the comic and then then saw it and it was like, oh, this makes sense. Like, of course it makes sense. It's it's pretty much the pains from the comic just moving. Yeah. And, was, and it, that's, that's kind of when it started to become more clear that like you can... You just it, it takes a lot of skill to to relay that story like through animation and like it's it was really well done and this this all came to a head last night while I was watching Rebels I was on the second episode and I was like this is I was two episodes in and realized that I I had no it, it wasn't even clear to me that I was watching an animated movie and that was like or an animated show and that's impressive like it yeah. I was immersed in the story and they did a really good job with I think they might have an easier job with the Star Wars property. One, because you throw a couple of sounds and music in there that I'm familiar with, and that's that's immediately throws me into it. Because I know, like, I'm so familiar with those sounds and that music and those themes. So I'm watching it, and, like, it starts off in, like, the it's like a Star Destroyer is coming up, and the music's playing. I'm like, I'm, I'm like, Star Wars, woo! Like, I'm, like, just, like, really excited. It's funny, that's one of those things that, like, if, if you've listened, um, I don't know if you ever talked about. Did you ever listen to the second iteration of it for episode eight, the um, the podcast between um, Freddie Prince Jr. and Amina Hassan from ESPN? Yeah, I know you listened to the one for Rogue One, but no, um, I, 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 I listened to it. So he talked a lot about in the last Jedi one about the visual language of Star Wars, mm -hmm. and that's what you're describing right there yeah. is those certain visual cues that okay, I am watching Star Wars, I've seen that thing, and that is a Star Wars thing, and it's a shared commonality between all of them. It's not ripping off its own thing, it's like, almost in the same way that musical cues in the Star Wars universe work, but instead it's certain visual scenes that we're used to seeing, yeah. and not even just scenes, as effects and graphics that they do as well. Yeah, and it, it's it's really well done, when, and like it, they, they understand their design language. For Star yeah. Wars, and they it's it's shared well with the creators of all of the media that's coming out, and it was so like immediately I was thrown into it, and I was like I was really enjoying it from that scene. That was this was before I saw a character, and then the characters come on screen, and I feel like normally the characters that I was seeing I would not immediately appreciate their art style, but there was something that happened like a few minutes into the episode that it started to cap captivate me again, and that was. They do a really, really good job of showing emotion. Like they, they animate their emotions really, really well to the point where yeah, I was like, "Oh, the faces are expressive," act and and like with pinpoint accuracy. So like they, they never have to get like you're not going to suffer from an actor maybe not being able to deliver that or having to reshoot that over and over again. Like they, they can program that face. Like they can make that happen. And like. It, I'm. I don't feel like. Hmm, what was this character feeling? They do a really good job of me going. I know exactly how this person feels. I get it. Like they, they deliver that really well. Yeah. I. I was. It's funny because I remember watching. What, what was the other, the other Star Wars animated series, the Clone Wars? Yes. I tried watching that and I didn't get into it. That was a while back though. Yeah. So it's it's funny because something that played the run of Rebels, even though it was received very well. From a story, character, and uh, actors aspect, and especially with, they did some pretty groundbreaking stuff building the world and the lore of Star Wars in that show. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be a lot of people who miss out on that because it is a kids show, and you have to be a really big 
Star Wars fan. For the longest time, I just refused to watch the Clone Wars. I was like, oh, it's a kid show. And it is a kid show, but it's still Star Wars, and this is even more so. It's incredible. The guy who, who ran it was Dave Filoni, who cut his teeth as literally the apprentice to George Lucas. When the Clone Wars show was running, Lucas was involved, but Filoni really took the reins eventually. So a lot of stuff in Rebels is building back up the mysticism of the Force, which we've seen since The Force Awakened, and especially The Last Jedi, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the mysticism of the Force brought back. There's no more metachlorians, but now it's, you know, feeling the Force, the idea of balance and what that actually means. It's not the good guys win, it's balance. That right. There has to be equal light and dark and all that stuff. And they get into some more heady Force stuff in the show, and they still do a lot of serious stuff. In fact... Rebels, even more than the Clone Wars, gets really dark at times. Like, yeah. people die. <laughs> I was going to say, I, get, they, I can see that happening. And they, and even there was, though like, they keep it like, childlike to a certain extent, like, you don't see beheadings, there isn't dismemberment. Sure. There is a pretty big body count, although I've noticed both in the Clone Wars and in this show, the body count is typically um, faceless bodies getting exploded in a building or a uh, Star Destroyer getting blown up. Yeah. Because even, like, the Jedi fighting... Stormtroopers, typically those ones don't end with someone getting hacked and slashed with a lightsaber. It's a lot of usage of the Force, throwing, disabling, this and that. The death comes when someone blows up an entire Star Destroyer. And it's like, for a kid, it's like, oh, they blew up a Star Destroyer. And for me, I'm like, oh, wow, they just blew up a Star Destroyer and, like, the 5,000 people on that Star right. Destroyer. Like, that right. was fucking serious. <laughs> there, there was, it's funny, there's a, because I could see the... Disney does a really good job of this um, where you have a movie that you're watching and you can see like, oh yeah, like a kid's going to love every minute of this, but there's this other level for the parents that are watching it and you're just like, this is really funny. Hope my kid doesn't ask me about that. Yeah. <laughs> right? So this, there was one scene, and this is not a spoiler at all if you're going to watch that show, but uh, there's a guy, there's two guys on a, on a platform, on a bridge, and a stormtrooper gets shot off earlier and he falls off the side of it and they do the star wars the the canned star wars scream which i absolutely love which again scream? just it's just amazing and then later on another guy gets shot off but he he grabs onto a, a like a, a pillar of the bridge like a support structure of it and he's holding onto it and they they pan down to him holding onto it and the other stormtrooper that got shot off earlier is holding onto it as well and he goes huh first time seeing a jedi huh and the guy kicks him in the face and he goes flying off the thing, and the music is kind of funny, and then it goes really dark, and you're like, oh, my God. Like, yeah, like, a kid's going to see that and go, ha, ha, ha. And I'm just like, that guy is dead now. <laughs> it was it was really funny and then really dark, and I was like, this is, like, you you did it. Like, this is exactly the formula for capturing the child audience and then capturing the adults as well and doing it yeah, in a really... There's a lot of little things like that. Um, one second. Do you want to... I have to run upstairs real quick. Okay. Do you want to... Pause, or do you want to just ramble? Uh, let's see where let's let's try and ramble. I'll try and ramble. Go for it. I'll be as fast as I can. All right. So anyway, this this show, if you haven't seen Rebels, I would I would just get on get on that. Um, I'm I'm two episodes in and I'm completely sold. I don't know if anybody here listening plays uh, the X Wing Miniatures game, but this game is a it's a tabletop game where you uh, you can buy all these really awesome little Star Wars ships. If you're into Star Wars, this is totally up your alley. If you, especially if you like board games and or tabletop games, um, but you can buy these little models of these Star Wars ships, and then you can it's a almost like a role playing type thing, and you pick out your pilots and your abilities for the ships and the power ups and the weapons and things like that that are going to go on it. And you have this this fleet, and then you fight against another player who has a fleet that they've picked out on their own, and one of the things that I I was super into this game um, a couple of years back with my buddy Damien, and we we had a blast playing this. And I just got into it just like looking at the cards and stuff. I was just like I I was you know enthralled with all these different characters and all these different combinations of things that you could do. And I had never seen half these ships. Like they were always either mentioned, and I had an imagination of what they would look like or things like that. But some of these ships actually came into play in the in the within the first two episodes of of the show and i was like this is amazing so like there's what, what the uh i'm talking about star wars x-wing welcome back al uh it's a, oh, it's a tabletop game and this ah. this is the first time that i'm actually seeing some of those ships in some sort of visual like in something that well a movie or tv 
they usually like I've had the art style on cards or like I've seen pictures or imagined what they look like from their descriptions. What ship specifically? Uh, the Ghost, which is there. Yep. That's one of also them. Also in Rogue One, if you pay close attention at the end. Oh, really? I'll have to yep. I'll have to go back and watch. But there's also that now that you started watching the show, um, when they're at the base before the send their final trip to Scarif, you hear on the intercom someone calling for General Syndulla, mm-hmm. who was Hera, one of the main characters of the show, as well as at one point or another you see the droid chopper in the yeah. background somewhere. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I like that. So uh, one of the other ships, though, that really was really fun, uh, Damien got me this uh, gift for, I think it was my birthday a couple years back, but it's a one of the bigger ships in this tabletop game, which is the the ship that they board uh, in the first episode. I, I still don't, I don't remember the name of it, but... The Tanto 4? I have one. Like, I have the model of it, and it has this... a random ship to have. <laughs> but you can... It, it's actually really cool in this game, because you can actually attach TIE Fighters to it, and then you can deploy your TIE Fighters out from it. Nice. It's really, really sweet. Anyway, if you're into Star Wars and you, uh, you're you willing to drop, like, I don't know, 200 bucks on this, because you're not really going to have a good time until you do... <laughs> There's just there's a lot of stuff that you can get, but uh, it's it's totally it's totally worth looking into. And now uh, Will Wheaton does a, a tabletop game show on YouTube, and you can check it out. He did he did one on this, and it's I, I saw that before I started buying stuff. Damien when Damien got me into it, and it's it's totally worth it if you're a Star Wars fan. Very fun. But uh, I was curious if you ever had any experience like that with animated media. Well, yeah, for one, like I mean, just talking about getting into. The Clone Wars and Rebels, it took me a while to want to, from like I said, it was the idea of the childlike nature of it, and it was more because it was Disney than the fact it was animated, because I watched basically all of South Park, I'm a huge Family Guy fan, Archer is one of my favorite shows of all time, like, the animated thing is not a problem for me, as long as I can buy in on the concept, and I know what I'm getting from it. Mm-hmm. So that's what it comes down to more, because there's plenty of animated shows that I see commercials for. It's like, eh, that's not what I'm really looking for right now. You know what I mean? Sure. And if anyone should be looking for more Star Wars content, it's me. And it took me a long time to get into those shows, and I don't regret having watched them. Yeah. I mean, there's times where I'm like, okay, this is uh, well, more in Clone Wars. It's like, okay, this is a little bit repetitive, or where it's like the buy-in is like, okay, this is gonna be a little too childlike and kitschy for me. And it's like, but well, no, but it ends up working, and it's fine. It's just you gotta just gotta go with it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I still it's still kind of a mystery to me of which things I'm going to like and why. I will tell you another thing. What, the first thing I thought of when you brought up this topic, though, was taking something seriously when it's animated. Mm-hmm. And you said talking about art styles and video games. The first time I came across that was. Do you remember that game from about 15 years ago called Cell Damage? Yeah, I love that game. That but game was a lot of when fun. I, when I first saw it, I was like. That's probably stupid. It's like that, this animated, like... There's, like, car battles, right? With, like, car have, thing, like and crazy like, yeah, weapons. That looks dumb. Like, I don't want to play that. And then I thought, like, someone... Ha- like, a friend of mine had it, and, like, it's like, oh, this game's awesome. Play it. And I was like, oh, my God, this is not what I was expecting when right. I saw a cartoon animation. Like, I just watched a buzzsaw slice someone and their car in half, and he died and went to hell. <laughs> this is not what I anticipated. <laughs> yeah, the video games are really good at doing that. Yeah, I've. Uh, it's funny because I I used to be that way about video games as well, where it was like, oh, I wanted to play like the more realistic things, and that was kind of like when the I guess more like the turn of games becoming more realistic, like these like like Call of Duty Two is probably my first example or when I remember being like, oh, like I'm all about this game because of the graphics, and like I'm I'm really getting into that, and for a while that's what I was into. But now, like, I don't even care. Like, I just want to have a fun game to play. And there's there's just so many things that you, if you have that mindset, there's so many good things that you're going to miss. Like, there's there's one game that I've been playing called Cuphead. And this is, it's, it is the prettiest game I've ever played. It's all hand-drawn animations. Huh. And it's really, really cool. And it's an, it's like, it looks like an old-timey cartoon. And it has these really dark themes and it's just it just blows me away every time i turn it on really cool it's, it's easier for me to do this with video games i don't know why it's so hard to do it with um movies or tv i think it's all about buying like you know if you know 
what you're getting from it, or if you are able to understand what it's all about, it's easier to get past the animated thing. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, that's interesting. Something I'll keep an eye on. There's one thing that I still haven't gotten behind, and that's anime. I haven't found one that I like, and I think that might be the problem. Mm. But I've tried watching things, and I just, I, I just never got into it. Well, the thing is, some of those things, it's like, well, at this point, it's because I come to expect a certain thing from them. So that's why when I see the animation, I automatically am turned off from it because anime right. is not really. My, I mean, I know I've dabbled in a couple of little things, but really nothing more than dipping my toe in the water. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's just not really my thing either. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure I, I got to find somebody that likes the things that I like to, that also likes anime that could maybe point me in the direction of one that I can get behind. That's definitely part of it, too, is you got to find the right one to get involved with. Yeah. yeah. Um, moving on from this topic, there is an article that I came across earlier today about Ready Player One and how people are already mad at this movie. Oh, uh, not already. People have been mad for, like, two years about this movie. <laughs> yeah. And it... I, I'm reading... The, the arguments that I was reading, I, compl- I just disagreed with because, like, it, they were, like... They were whining about um, nothing being original and all this throwback stuff and things like that. But what bothered me on this one is that is that was its point from the beginning. It wasn't trying to hide that. It is a it's a pop culture dictionary of the eighties and nineties. And See, it's funny, I haven't seen anyone complain about the lack of originality. The thing I saw complaints about, which I think you'll also have a problem with, though at least you'll be able to understand it is people are having trouble or are disliking it on the surface for it being exactly that. They don't like that. It is this referendum on that culture because it's lauding the idea of kind of with us or against us type of thing. Like either you're in on all the jokes and references or you're not. And it's cool to be in on them and stuff like that. Basically, lauding hyper geek culture. Okay, but why be mad by that? Because of the superiority that's coming along with it, and the people who are adherents to it. But the movie is well, not the movie. The story is made for a specific group of people. I know. Um, the idea should be that, considering a lot of the, this isn't my take. This is what I'm taking from what people are saying about this particular brand of outrage. Mm -hmm. Um, What the argument I've seen is, is that what the people who were really into like geek culture of the eighties and nineties, their biggest complaint for the longest time is that inclusiveness was tough. Like if you were really, really into things back then you were treated like shit. Uh-huh. And now those same people are turning back and doing that to people who are casual, who want to be in on, on this sort of stuff. You know what I mean? Are they though? That's not. I. That is not how. That is a very negative way to look at this. I feel. And, and that that, that bothers true. me. I'm I, I'm still trying to get my wrap my head around this conversation. And I'm just yeah. telling because I've been seeing stuff about that, especially in the last couple of weeks. It's been for the past year or so that I've been seeing it hit here and there, but with the movie imminently arriving i'm seeing more of it now right, but so like, i'm getting more exposure to it and my understanding of their arguments is coming into shape and if that if that is the argument that is that's kind of makes a lot of sense with a lot of the things that i've been reading but it, it just makes me a little bit more frustrated by it because i don't see it that way as like a, they're turning around doing this the other way i see it as wow what a what a time to be a nerd or what a time to have been a nerd for yeah. a re- like because I I mean I grew up loving all of these things and now I have this medium that is like it I mean this is like my childhood bible this book like yeah. I love it well to be clear what these people who are complaining about are saying they're not targeting you because you are who is quote unquote supposed to be excited about this yeah it's as with all of these cases the fringe who is getting ultra overly protective about the property and what the property represents. And because of the nature of internet and internet culture, and the fact that the people who are at the worst of the internet culture are the ones who are the same right. 
uber strict adherence to this sort of thing, it's dovetailing together and creating this fever pitch. And it's funny because like that was I I had I went through this roller coaster of emotions that I read that because I was furious because I. I was like, I was like, just stop. One, just don't hate on this thing until it comes out. If it comes out and it is bad, like that, that is a real possibility that the movie's not good, and that's okay. You can hate it then, but stop. The movie's not out yet. That was that was really pissing me off. And then I was like, who am I kidding? This is the exact like I should have known this was coming, right? Yeah. Like this is this the audience that you're trying to capture is the is half of it is the audience that complains on the internet. Yes, that's exactly the thing. And it, it is it is pretty crazy. Those people are being spurred to greater heights, and that's what the pushback Ugh. is centered around. And also, I've at least noticed consistency. A lot of the people who are complaining about this and the fringe element are mm-hmm. people who are like, yeah, I read the book, didn't like it because of that thing, and now seeing it amplified through this blockbuster release is making it doubly worse. And then also there's just this whole side thing where people are just making fun of all the marketing materials because they're ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, some of the marketing material is pretty bad, but <laughs> that, that, that's the biggest thing I've been seeing the last few days. I, I, it's just—it's funny though, because like, if people are just—and uh, this is just my own personal philosophy. Like, people are just so goddamn negative all the time, and I—I I refuse to subscribe to that. Like, I am—I was when I read this book, I was floored. I like every page, chock full of references, and even even ones that are that are so subtle and in passing that if you don't get it, it's fine. But if you do, it makes that page so much better to read, right? And then I was like, "This is this is perfect for someone like me who is who loves all these movies that they're that are being referenced referenced and these games." And I'm like, every every time I find a little extra nugget, I'm like really excited. But and then I saw the the, the trailer and I saw what they were doing with this same concept, but kind of making it more modern for like a more modern audience with a throwback that is not as far thrown back as the things in the book. And I was like, oh. That's actually really cool, and I thought that was awesome and a great idea, like to make it more relevant for a person that would be like the the age that I identify with when I'm reading it is a much younger than I am now, and the yeah. movie I feel like is trying to identify with that age, which I think is a really good thing to do. And I'm I'm I am so excited for this movie. You know that I am because I every time the trailer's on, I'm like, shut up, <laughs> let me watch. <laughs> You're not the only one, and it's funny because you and I, I haven't read the book, um, I'm I'm like really interested in this, and I'll see it because you want to see it, and we'll do an episode on it, uh, and I, I don't do that with any hesitation, I, I, I don't mind going to see this movie, sure. um, but you're caught on like the very trailing edge of the Adrian just pitched you, my two yeah. cousins, Dennis and Mike, hey guys, I know you're probably listening, <laughs> uh, <laughs> They both told me how excited they are for this movie as well because they're kind of closer to the upper bound. They're a few years older than you, yeah. so. Well, that's good to hear that. At least there's some other people that are excited about it. it makes me happy. Yeah, I feel no, like I mean, there are a lot of people that are excited for it. The problem is, and what's causing all this ire is that a lot of those people are the type who are mad and loud on the internet all the time, yeah. and they're mad and loud or on steroids about this movie. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's just uh, one of the annoying things though is, and I mean, the whole basis of this show is you and me going to see movies and then talking about them to each other for at length afterwards. Right. And days and weeks after a movie comes out that we've seen, we talk about it. The problem with something like this is part of the enjoyment that I get out of this. It's like, I want to share this with somebody else that also experienced it. And I'll be able to do that with some of my friends that, that are like the exact same age. And I mean, even you'll get a, good chunk of it i mean we're only a couple of years apart but it's, I'm sure it, it does... i mean I, i've engaged with a lot of the same media you have so yeah no i know it, it's funny it's i'll weird, get though, most that, of it anyway or that at least couple feel of like years i know that that's a thing you know yeah no for sure but i was just like saying there's there's gonna be so much i there's already negativity around this and there's going to be so much that it's just gonna it's just gonna put a damper on that whole thing and i'm just gonna have to cut those people out <laughs> just gonna have to put a block filter on that stuff well, I'm curious to see the people who are zealots about the book, how they're going to respond. Because from what I understand, that whole big race thing they're pitching was not in the book at all. Right. So making that big of a... Because a lot of the trailer treatments treated like that might be kind of the central event of the movie. 
It's it's not. It's just the way that the trailer is made. I'm pretty sure. I, under- I understand I, I what know, they're it doing. Seems like there's a lot of resources being thrown into that. So like that's the, like it's a thing, and I feel like the length at which that it happens in the trailer is probably like the length of which you would consider it throughout the book. But it's not. It's not going to be like a. If it is the the main focus of the, it's not going to be. Here, that, that's the, I'm just telling you that was the conversation I remember hearing about a year ago when the first full trailer came yeah. out. I mean, that was real. You know what the point of that was, though, and what I'm thinking that everybody kind of missed is they're having a hard time marketing the movie just because the because of the concept. If they showed what was going on in the movie, it would it would just be a weird trailer, like what they're trying to do. I don't know. I'm I'm I can't edit this thing to to make the the trailer that would make it make sense. But I like what they're showing you in those scenes is hey. It, they are showing you the thing of like it's it's full of references like because if you if you freeze frame all of that and you just take a look there's just a crap load of stuff in there and that is that is how you feel reading the book like there's so many things going on that are so just relevant to that time frame and like those interests like they were they failed at doing it with the trailer but I already got it because I knew the book well it's the nature of any of those trailers it's funny because after we saw annihilation we recorded the episode. And the next day I went home and I started reading some of the stuff. Like there's a, a an article they do um, on The Ringer for any big movie releases. Anyone who's on this writing staff who wants to go see the movie, they go and see the movie when it's released. And then all of them do a joint Q&A article where someone pitches a question and they all write their response to it. So I really like reading those things about movies that I really want to go see. But I usually read them after I see the movie because right. they typically discuss – some things in detail that happened in the movie. So I went back and I read the Annihilation thing and I started engaging some of the other Annihilation stuff that I really tried to avoid spoilers from previously. And I went back and I rewatched the trailer. It's like, wow, I won't say this trailer lied to us, which is something we've discussed a lot, but they did a really good job of misdirection throughout like, the whole yeah. fucking trailer. Yeah, like it, it, watching the trailer for Ready Player One, I can tell you there's two things that are crucial and the rest of it is just filler to make you understand the like the tone of the whole yeah. thing. And the the two things are one is this guy is there's this virtual there's this virtual reality game that is a big deal that literally everybody plays and basically not only plays they live their lives in it. Like kids go to school in this thing which is not shown in the thing but like they they live their lives through it. And he's hidden an easter egg in the game. If you find the Easter egg, you now own it because this man has died. Mm. That's that's the premise. And if you find the Easter egg, you'll you know you inherit the business basically. The what they don't tell you, which kind of so makes, it's basically Willy Wonka. Yes that that is that is basically what it says on the back of the book. Oh really? Yeah. It's it's not it's not hiding that. It's a it's also it's it's very self aware of every reference that it makes. <laughs> And I think there's probably people who are kind of on the outside who are going to look at these sorts of things and be like, well, it's just Willy Wonka, which is what I just did kind of tongue in cheek. Yeah. But you can do that thing where it's an homage or a mix up or a rewrite of these sorts of things as long as you do it self aware. It's the ones that don't present it as, hey, we're in on the joke, guys, where it becomes a problem because it's just like pure pastiche at that point. I'm like, that's really bad. Mm hmm. Yeah, but man, I'm I'm so excited, and this is this is coming up quick. This is this month. Is it next week? No, I think when we were talking about it the other day, I think it's the end of the month. I think it's like the thirtieth okay. or something. Like that. Oh, I can't wait! So excited. That's a maybe. Maybe I'll get some like a Thursday night to that. I hope. I hope. Oh, if it's, we'll see. We'll find out. I'm gonna do. I want to see this movie as soon as possible. I just realized that I have a really big work release thing on the thirtieth, so I'm hoping that it's not that date, but I think it is. <laughs> Could be problematic. Uh, that's so lame. All right, I'll have to, I'll have to figure that out. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's that's all. I just wanted to I wanted to wrap about that a little bit because it was it was bothering me. Now the next thing on the list here is Star Wars news, but this ties nicely into this week's edition of Al's Nuggets. <laughs> so Al, I hate you so much. Please take the reins. Sure. Um... Show us your nuggets. <laughs> Getting worse. Uh, it's getting gonna worse. get even worse. <laughs> so anyway, by the time you guys are all listening to this, since we're recording this ahead of time, it won't be new news, though it may have slipped under the radar for you if you're not super plugged into like movie and TV news all the time. 
Uh, they've announced they announced a while back, and we discussed it on the show before with the Disney acquisition of Fox and the Disney planned expansion of their own standalone streaming stuff, where they're going to pull all their content except for the Marvel shows off Netflix and do their own Disney standalone streaming service. They announced that they're going to be doing another animated Star Wars show, and I think two live action Star Wars shows. Mm-hmm. Not at the same time, necessarily, but today they announced that one of those shows will be helmed by John Favreau, who, it's funny, I wasn't really much of a fan of him the first few things I saw him in. I guess he had a bigger presence in some 90s movies that I haven't been aware of mm. until more recently that I still what, haven't seen yet. What were the first few things you saw him in? <sighs> I don't remember. I mean, one of them is like Couples Retreat, wasn't a huge fan of him in that. He mm. was in... I love you, man. I, he was annoying in that. He had a bit part in Iron Man, and I didn't know at the time that, like, he wrote and directed it too. Like, <laughs> but then I realized, like, oh, he's been transitioning to a lot of behind the camera and production stuff. He's got his hands in a lot of things because he did the first two Iron Men. I'm pretty sure. I think Shane Black did the third one. Um, he did. He's doing the Jungle, or he did the Jungle Book movie. Did that already come out? Or no, no, sorry. I think about it. Before. He's doing the Lion King movie. That's what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he's like an executive. He did, he did do the Jungle Book, though. I thought. Did he do both of them? Uh, maybe I he did. think so. Let me check. I'm gonna pull this up real quick. He was the uh, producer. He's listed as a producer on the Jungle Book, but I think he had more involvement than that. I think he's an executive producer on. He directed the Jungle Book. Yeah, he's doing the Lion King as well. Yeah, and the Jungle Book too. Yeah, and um. He, he's the executive I can't even think of the fucking show now which is crazy because I actually watched the show uh, <laughs> the show that was on MTV and they moved it to Spike uh, the Shannara Chronicles uh, he's like one of the executive producers on that um, so he's got his like fingers in all of these things so he's now going to be the showrunner and write and direct some of I'm sure um, a standalone Star Wars thing, I was like, huh, he doesn't really seem like the type, but along with the press release, like, it sounded just like Abrams and Ryan Johnson, where it was like, Star Wars was really important to me when I was young, yeah. and it's like one of my dreams to have ever been involved with a Star Wars, and apparently he has a role <laughs> in the Solo movie. I wish you said a Star Wars, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's got a, he, he had a role in Solo, I don't know if it's just voicing some alien one-off thing or something like that, but I know he's got a role in Solo. Okay. Um, to some degree, and he's going to be in charge of one of these live-action shows. Which I'm really excited to see what they're planning on doing with that. It's Same. still a year or two away, um, so it's you know we're gonna a while to wait for all of that. But they're they're doing a lot of announcing of that finally, which is really cool because we were talking a couple months ago where it's like, where are they going next? Like we see Solos on the horizon. There's an unnamed project that may or may not be Obi One coming out in a couple of years. They're, they just said that the script was finished for episode 9, so they're going to start working on that soon. Mm-hmm. Um, but after that, with Rebels ending, what's next? And Dave Filoni has already said, I'm prepping the next animated show. It'll be around sooner than you think, and details on what that's going to be is pretty soon now. Maybe they'll tie that to Star Wars Day this year. I don't know. Oh, that would be cool. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I'm... Hearing that sort of excitement, I don't know why, I mean, it's just the kind of the roles that John Favreau has played in a couple of things I've seen him in, where he just seems always very standoffish and, like, douchey, that I'm just like, he doesn't feel like Star Wars to me, and maybe he's the nicest guy in the world in real life, I don't know, but, um, yeah, no, he just seemed, like, excited, like anyone, yeah. you hear yeah. that era who, who gets tapped to do one of these things, where he's just like, yeah, man, like, I'm excited to have an, uh, the ability to imprint Star Wars, like, I get to do a Star Wars and I'm super excited. And that's what I want to hear, man. I, yeah, I, like, yeah, for sure. If you aren't fully committed to doing Star Wars, I don't want you within a <laughs> yeah, get, away, get away from you my know content. What I mean? like, so, I don't know. It's interesting news. And seeing that he's getting involved in more projects behind the camera now, and, and the fact that I've enjoyed some of those things, I, I'm not so worried. It was my first initial visceral reaction was to it. I got to say, the I things guess. that I've seen that he's directed, I've been a fan of. Yeah, me too. Elf, so Iron Man, Iron Man Two, off. Jungle Book, they all, all awesome. Um, yeah. Chef is really where it's at for me. I don't know if you saw Chef, but that movie is. I didn't. I know he. I know he. Um, 
he did that, but I didn't see that. That movie is wonderful. I thoroughly enjoyed that one. Did not realize he directed Cowboys and Aliens. I didn't see that. Didn't see it, but um, he directed Elf. Yeah. Okay, I've changed my mind on him. He might be cool. He directed <laughs> Elf, and he was also he was also the doctor in Elf. Well, I know he was in yeah. the movie. I just didn't realize he directed it. Yep. It feels weird that I didn't know who directed Elf because I've seen the movie a million times, and knowing those sorts of things is kind of my thing, as you and some of our listeners may know. Right. Well, think about it. If he he directed Elf, he directed Iron Man. He's got the ability to deliver a dramatic story plus the humor, which is what Star Wars is is very much becoming, like a 50, almost a 50-50 split. Yeah. <laughs> which is, I mean, I, I, I know people are up in arms about that, but it's I've been enjoying the ride. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm excited to see where this goes. Yeah, me too. So, Cheers to you, John Favreau. <laughs> Also, Good luck, sir. You'll your, need it. your uh, play Happy in Spider-Man Homecoming was a treat for everyone. <laughs> yeah. That was wonderful. <laughs> that Well, especially the, the whole first sequence where he's, like, making the movie about, like, yep. his events in Civil War and, yep. like, the, like, the found footage of him, like, walking in. He's got, the wall's really thin, man. Like, I, I heard everything. <laughs> That's great. Oh, man, I love it. So, uh, what other nuggets you got for us? I have one other nugget, um, which by the time this episode airs, maybe we'll have a little bit more clarity on. But, you know, as the case is when any time there's like a big movie that comes out, you hear a lot about the people involved with it that maybe you hadn't heard in the past or hear new versions of old stories and stuff like that. So after we watched and recorded Annihilation, you gave me the movie Dread, because mm. I never got a chance to watch it, who Alex Garland wrote um, before his directorial debut, which he wrote and directs Ex Machina, and now he wrote and directs Annihilation, and he's announced that he's doing a show on FX that we should be getting some details on soon that's also going to be sci-fi related. And I remember when Dread came out, I've seen, I never even saw the whole thing, but I've seen parts of the original Judge Dread movie. Oh, yeah. And I know it's like it's it's based on comic series, right? Yeah, I mean, there's there's graphic novel behind it, but there's or a graphic novel, whatever. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that uh, I actually I could be I think it might have been a comic series. Uh, I thought it was a series, but either way, um, when I saw they were like remaking Dread like a couple of years ago, I was like hard pass. And then I saw like Carl Urban was going to be in there. I was like, oh, I kind of like him. Still pass. Uh, there was a <laughs> crap load out. of comics. Yeah. That's what I thought. Um, and then when it came out, it didn't really do that well commercially, but ended up being critically received fairly well, mm-hmm. and um, ultimately developed a really big cult following, which I've seen in the last year or two. I was very surprised by that. I was like, thought that movie was just a complete nothing burger, and apparently there's a hardcore group yeah. of people who really loved that movie. I haven't had a chance to sit down and watch it yet, but... I've been seeing interviews with Alex Garland and people who've worked with Alex Garland, and for some reason... Of all things, Carl Urban's gotten a few interviews lately, and the first thing he said a couple days ago was that he would still be open to reprising the role if they make a movie sequel to it. Um, And I thought at the time, a couple years ago, there had been talks about doing a series to follow up on like Showtime or Cinemax or something like that, but they never ended up, it fell through and never ended up working, whatever, and he had said at the time like he would reprise the role for that. I guess he really enjoyed working on this movie. So then, like, another day later, uh, in, I think, a separate interview, a story came out where Carl Urban said, yeah, guys, Pete Travis did not direct Dread. Alex Garland did. So stop saying Ex Machina is his directorial debut. He directed Dread, and it was fucking awesome. And that's why we all loved doing the movie, and that's why everyone should want a Dread 2, because that movie was fucking awesome. And the people I've seen who... Have an opinion on Dread? I've never seen someone say that movie sucked. I've only ever seen, admittedly not that often, but how much people like that movie. Which, that's kind of a big bombshell in Hollywood. I didn't realize this, but uh, the follow-up to that story was that supposedly this has been a fringe rumor in Hollywood for a long time, that there was a question as to who actually directed the movie. Really? But people were wondering whether there's going to be a big controversy if, you know, there's a guild for all this, the Screen Actors Guild, there's the yeah, Directorial yeah. Guild... Uh, production, all that sort of stuff. Um, people are, they said, uh, you know, after the story came out, uh, something tells me the director guild is going to be calling some or maybe many people very angrily over the next couple of days. Oh, man. 
That's really funny. Yeah, I, so I got a kind of cool story. I, I don't know what it's worth, but my my experience with Dread was was pretty much I, it's going to be what yours is. <laughs> so I I saw the trailers when it came out, and I was like, oh, okay. I remember, you know, I saw the the original movie when I was younger, and I was like, I enjoyed it because it was you know an action flick at that time, which I I always enjoyed those. And it was from the little movie. bits that I remember because I saw it a few years ago. Mm-hmm. It was very much of its time. Oh yeah. I am the law. <laughs> like, it, it, it was it was great. <laughs> but anyway, like so I remember being like, oh, this, that's cool. I remember enjoying the original. I'll, I'll probably go see this. And then whatever happened, I don't remember when it was released or what happened, but I didn't see that one in theaters. And I'm pretty sure it was at a time where like I was at the movie theater like every Friday. So I don't know why I didn't see it. But um, I just never got around to it. And then I, my buddies were like, hey, you should you should check it out. Like it was like they, they went to see it. They said it was really good. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, I'll get to it at some point. Um, time passed, time passed, time passed. I was in Best, Best Buy and I was hovering over the bin as I do because there's $5 Blu-rays there and I own as many movies as I could find that I've seen and enjoyed. So <laughs> I saw this one. I was like, oh, $5. I can rent it for this amount of money or I can put it in my collection. <laughs> so I bought it and I put it in. I was like, I, I, that night I watched it and I was like, this was one of the. This was one of those movie nights with myself. I have an article about this <laughs> a long time ago. But uh, I watched. It, I was like, the movie starts off. I'm like, something. There's something. Something good is gonna happen here. And like as the movie goes on, I'm like this. This movie's good. <laughs> and then I'm like getting really excited as it continues. And when it ends, I was like. Wow, a lot of people missed the boat on this one. Me included. <laughs> and it was. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. It seems like that's the case. It was one of those things that just, for whatever reason, didn't resonate big picture, but it's got a hardcore following of people who love that movie. That's that's what I keep hearing for the last two or three years. Yeah, I can imagine, like, I never read any of the comics, but I can imagine that it's probably, if, if it's got this much of a hardcore following, that it's probably... It's probably very close to the like to the themes and the way that character should really be. That, that would be, my, case, that would be sure. my guess. I don't know, but I I know that I really enjoy the movie. Yeah, I'm looking forward to watching it. Uh, I almost watched it the other night, and it was like one of those things where it was like, I could watch it right now, and it won't be that late when I go to bed. That I probably should. Have yeah. To watch it. <laughs> ready, ready to watch it, like. But it, it'll happen soon. And also, by the way, it spurred me. Um, uh, well, at the time of this recording, I will receive X Machina sometime tomorrow. Oh, nice! Uh, you ordered it. I bought it for seven bucks on Amazon. So nice, very nice. Um, do you have any more nuggets? No, that was the last of my nuggets. I just thought that was kind of a cool insider story. It, yeah, that's there. Neither of us is insiders, but we find some of these things interesting. That's kind of a bombshell, even though it's about a movie that not enough people cared about. <laughs> right. I'd love to know more about that. Yeah, I'd love to see, like, follow up if this story really gets reported on, because apparently it's been a rumor amongst the people who would be trading in those sorts of rumors for quite some time. It's just because this movie didn't matter enough. Like, if this was a Star Wars movie, we would have known by now. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like, people care about that sort of shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Sweet. Well, without further ado, let's get into our flick of the week. So it's you know we're a little late on this one, um, but it somehow became timely anyway. Uh, better get, late than never? Question mark. Better late, better late than, than never? Yeah, question mark. Sure. Uh, get out is our movie of the week, and you know what a perfect time to do this with it just winning an Oscar, which I am very happy about, and we'll get into that uh, when we start discussing the movie a little bit further. But if you don't know what Get Out is, crawl out from under that rock. Um, it is a young I'm just, African-American... I was going to say something when you brought up the Oscar thing. Yeah. If you told me five or six years ago that Jordan Peele was going to win an Oscar, yeah. I would have left you out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I agree. So and the, this is from someone who loved Key and Peele. <laughs> the, the, the quick synopsis is a young African-American visits his white girlfriend... Parent, his... Blah visits his white girlfriend's parents for the weekend where his simmering uneasiness about their reception of him event about their reception of him eventually reaches a boiling point. I don't know why I couldn't get that out. I apologize. Um, that's, you know, basic synopsis, but this, this movie, man, 
It's a good movie. And like when we I know that like when during Oscar season when the nominees came out, I was like all gung ho to see um everything that was nominated and I wanted to see this beforehand and I never got to it. And yeah, we were supposed to do we guys we didn't do any sort of announcement because we missed it by a week or so, but guys, we've been doing the show for over a year now. Um just a little yeah. over a year. And I saw this movie when it came out in anticipation of us doing it, an episode on it, and we just never got to it because Anthony never got a chance to see it in right. the theaters. That was one of the ones – yeah, we, I think we – if you go back and listen, we probably talked about wanting to do it and just never yeah, – so. I never got to see it when it was in theaters, which is really funny because like I, eventually when I did see it, it was it was just on HBO now. I was able to just throw it on, and it was great. Yeah, I watched it the other night to refresh myself because I saw it a year ago. Like I remembered the big things, but I knew I was going to want to – Talk about some things in in much closer detail, and since we're not getting into spoilers yet, I'll just say completely forgot about the whole opening scene. I was like, "Oh yeah, wow, that was really dramatic," and I don't remember that happening at all. But yeah. a lot of the other stuff I remember pretty well, so I don't know. It seemed like the type of thing I should not have forgotten at the opening scene. <laughs> but this this movie is great, and I really like. I really enjoyed it. I remember we went, we went, when we got through it. I was like, when it ended, I was like, "This is." Like, oh, yeah, like, I get it. Like, there was a lot of movies this year that were up for Best Picture, and there was movies that really deserved it. There's movies that I was like, I get it. I actually should say, I think this deserves it. Um, and then there's movies like Phantom Thread. But. <laughs> I took, I completely took you out on that, the uh, our Facebook post about Lady Bird. <laughs> I oh, I read. actually didn't read it. <laughs> I didn't take you out, but basically it was like the version of, like, Subtweeting you, like I completely threw you under the bus without naming you. That's Basically, fine. Said, once you listen, you'll know who I'm, who's being talked about here. <laughs> That's fine. I mean, I stand by my opinion on that movie. I just didn't. I, I it was perfectly okay. That's fine. Um, but Get Out, on the other hand, I this movie I enjoyed, and this movie winning an Oscar is fantastic. And let's start there, because this type of movie does not get nominated, and this type of movie does definitely does not win. And it is awesome to see both of those things happen. Well, going back historically, at least that's probably the case. Um, considering Best Director and Best Picture was won by a movie about a, wo- a mute woman fucking a fish, this movie can win. <laughs> fair. <laughs> Very fair. Uh, actually, on that note, there's a... I don't know if you watch... Um, Spoiler alert for the Oscars right. and The Shape of Water, guys. Sorry. No, that's, that's fine. Uh, it's, it's it's all over everywhere. If you didn't find out about it, it definitely didn't come from us. Uh, there's you you know honest trailers. You watch them as well, right? Uh, what every once in a while when I see one for a movie that I'm particularly interested in seeing it for. So I love honest trailers, and I'll check in every couple of weeks and just like go back and see things. I'll only watch it obviously for things that I have seen because they they are pretty spoilery. Uh, but they <laughs> they did an Oscars episode. And it was it was just really wonderful. <laughs> it was just so good. And uh, there's there's so many like you just if you've listened to this show and you've seen even half of the Oscar movies, you should totally just go watch that because it is absolutely hysterical. <laughs> but he does mention that about The Shape of Water. He goes like from visionary director Guillermo del Toro, who is contractually obligated to be called visionary director Guillermo del Toro, <laughs> and. There's a. Uh, it's at the end of like talking about Shape of Water. He goes, "Oh man, this is gonna be the, the one that we refer to as the movie where the girl fucks the bitch, isn't it?" <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! But uh, you should you should see that so that we can discuss that one as well. That was. Uh, I, I actually I really enjoyed Shape of Water. Um, so, sorry guys, we should be a little bit less crass. It's the tasteful representation representation of intraspecies erotica. <laughs> <laughs> And Anthony almost just did a spit take uh, with very little bit reminded of rem- remained of his fear. Oh boy! I'm watching that, him jump to death on the screen here. That could have been, oh, that could have been bad. If you if you said the line exactly as it said in Clerks too, the beer would have definitely come out my nose. Oh, I got you. I'm talking about the donkey show. Yeah, Kelly can be a guy's name too. Hey. Oh, it's so bad. But all right, so um, get out. So this movie, there's Is that a command or get out of here. But <laughs> there's, it's got it. It's funny because like this is like I said, like I don't know, I don't know what other way to describe this other than this is not an Oscar style movie, right? Like, well, when you're comparing it to the other ones, for example, 
going back to that that honest trailers, they said they he talks about the post for a little wait, bit. Hey, hang on, hang on a second. Wait, 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 I spoilers? Are spoilers gone? Well, no, no, we're not getting into that yet. Okay. But go, I just want to be careful when we're talking about honest trailers. So. Oh no 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 no! This is the honest trailers for the Oscars. They didn't actually spoil anything in the movies. Okay. Um. So he goes. Uh, he's talking about the post, and he says that the name of the movie should just be Academy Award nominated movie, The Post. Like that should be the name of it, and like that that makes sense. Like this, that's the type of movie that you're like, you see that movie, and you're like this is gonna be up for Oscars. Yeah, remember that that comic by James Chapman, I think it was the one I showed you about yeah. historical figures struggling, yep. or the struggles of historical figure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But like, it's just those types of movies. Like those are the ones that normally get up, and this this one it doesn't. It's against the grain completely. And but it it is so deserving. And if a movie like this is going to be up for an Oscar, I'm really really hoping that it starts to kind of change, like the spectrum of which things get nominated. You would have thought the narrative would have started to shift with Lord of the Rings winning. Um, not really, because. Epics have won in the past. Yeah, but none of them have been orcs. <laughs> <laughs> none of them had orcs, though. <laughs> the closest thing you have is like biblical epics, which were still grounded in some levels of historical, you know, accuracy. Right? Mm-hmm. Not giant flaming eyes and wizards and orcs and elves. You know what I mean? Right. There's really nothing that's high fantasy delivered for the layman, but it is it is literally the definition of high fantasy. It was what created the fucking genre, mm-hmm. Lord of the Rings. Tolkien was one of the progenitors of the entire style. High fantasy does not get nominated for Oscars. Yeah. Well, except for costume design. Right. <laughs> and if you want more about that, go see the Star Wars thing that you can you share that out? Have you done that already? I, it was it was linked in well it was linked in our article, so it was in the synopsis. So anyone who's only listening through one of the listening things won't be able to find the link. I got because it doesn't doesn't pick up those hyperlink things yeah. when you pick up the text. But uh, it's the how it should have ended uh, Oscars twenty eighteen episode. It's like two or three minutes long, guys. Check it out. I mean, Anthony got a pretty good laugh. Real, out of it. really funny stuff there. Uh, so, but th- this movie's got like this is the type of so I okay I'm trying to trying to find my words here. So I really enjoy Oscar season. I enjoy the movies that are up for Oscars for the most part, with the exception of Phantom Thread, and I'm going to <laughs> beat that horse to death. Uh, so there's. Could you imagine if you were into this as much ten years ago and had to deal with the artist winning? Uh. <laughs> Stop. All right. So here's the thing. After the season is over. I'm good on that style of movie. I've seen enough, and I can take a break. Like, to the point where, like, yeah, hell yeah, I'm ready for Ready Player One. And since we're getting ready towards popcorn flick season, you have the opportunity to wipe your palate of that. Exactly. Exactly. And I'm sure by the end of May, I will be ready for more. <laughs> but there's, it's, I'm very much done with that for now. This movie does not fit into that category, and it came out in February. <laughs> Well, for one, it's a horror movie, which is pretty sure. rare nomination on its own. Like, I think The Exorcist was nominated, and I think The Shining was nominated, and Silence of the Lambs won, although technically it's not considered horror, it's a thriller. Mm-hmm. I was hearing some debate about that recently with the idea of if Get Out were to have won, that it would have been revolutionary, for not just for the style of a movie, you know, talking about Wait. social commentary and the way that it is and all this allegorical stuff, but just oh, it's a horror movie. Like, it is what, what it is, is. What is the... I feel like it walks the line of horror thriller. Where would you say... I mean, it's, both. It's, 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 it's both. I mean, most often horror movies have thriller aspects to them, right? Sure. But thrillers don't have to be horror movies on their own. Mm-hmm. And I guess this is... It's not a monster movie, but it's it's a horror movie. Okay, I think that's fair. It's a it's a horror movie. There's but it's aspects a- of psychological and body horror to it. Sure, it's Plus, it's a horror movie that's like it walks the line between horror and thriller and leans heavily onto the horror side of that line. But yes. it is not like it's not like a classic horror movie though. 
And if it were, and if they were to go like well, would you hard consider like that, would you consider Annihilation to be a horror movie? No. Because I do. <laughs> it no, I, I do. I, that I, way, I, that's a horror movie. Like, I consider that other movie, things also, but it's a horror movie. I feel that movie is on the line between sci-fi and horror and leans heavily on the sci-fi side. That's how I see that. I mean, it's it's in the same way that you would look at Ex Machina from Garland as well, except this leans even more into the horror aspect than Ex Machina does. Even though that one does nearly like a send-up mm-hmm. of the classic poltergeist scene in front of the mirror. <laughs> right. Yeah, I don't know. But I, I just, I hope that, I mean, here's the, the real thing is that this is hopefully not just a one-off thing. But it's very possible that it will be, which is, which can be frustrating. What do you mean? Like, like a movie like this getting nominated for Best Picture. Oh, okay. I want to see more of this. Sorry, I was worried that you were talking about like us getting a Get Out two. No, 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 no. Get out again? No. Come Keep back. Getting... <laughs> <laughs> that would be really funny if he did that, and it was just a straight up comedy. Like that would be hilarious. <laughs> It's just the TSA guy, and it's straight to DVD. <laughs> I would watch that. It gets turned into just like a buddy cop flick between him and yes. <laughs> like him and like and, and what's his name? Like the uh, I can't even remember Chris. Is that, yeah, Chris. Yeah. David Kaluuya's name. <laughs> That's funny. But so yeah, that ugh, man, this movie is this movie's great. So there's uh, without getting into spoilers, there's a couple of things I'm going to run down real quick. Um, first off, this movie starts off creepy. Very creepy. Then takes a step back. Let you kind of... A, a major step back. and lets you enjoy the character a little bit. Understand the characters. The main ones. There's some lighthearted stuff that goes on. And then it gets real for a little bit. And then it gets real twisted. Like that is... That's... That is the the way that the like I I like navigated that movie. I was like, huh. and then I was like, huh, oh, okay, okay, this is funny. I was like, ooh, I'm uncomfortable. This this really sucks because this is a real thing. And then it was like, oh, what what the goddamn hell? <laughs> that, that is that's that's the roller coaster this movie takes you on, and it's it's masterfully done. Yeah, uh, we'll get into the specifics a little bit and later also on. Something I feel like we've talked about well, not last week, but in other recent episodes. Um, did a good job of using humor as a tension breaker where things are building and it's getting uncomfortable and you're like kind of like shifting in your seat and like we get a little laugh and it's like, okay, we reset really ourselves to yep. a slightly less peak and state like it's like, okay, we can get back to that again. You right. Know? And I think that's important because if you don't have that, you can't get through the movie without cringing the whole way. And if you do that, you'll probably not enjoy the movie and the movie probably doesn't become an Oscar nominee. Yeah. Like, it is, the way that it's executed is, like, all of that, and is the reason that it got there. Well, especially because, like, there's a lot of biting social commentary, and listeners, we'll, we'll just apologize now. Um, we're probably not equipped enough to talk fair. about just Absolutely how fair. big and important a lot of these things are, because, spoiler alert, if you can tell from our voices or the picture on <laughs> all of our things, we're two white guys in their late 20s, <laughs> early 30s, so... <laughs> Whoa! Whoa! Late twenties, just late twenties. I've got a few months to go. Closing in. <laughs> it's it's right now when we're recording this. It's March eighth. You literally have two months. It's coming in hot. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you you are absolutely correct. It's but in so bear with us. With... We try our best, but we may miss things. We may gloss over things because we don't want to fuck up. Yeah, and there's also. Like like you said, we're, one we're not well equipped to, to talk about certain things or really like address them, but they, a lot of these things have already been addressed a lot. So we're gonna give you That's our it. take on the movie. So, right, and we're not like we're, we're not here to just recap all that stuff. We're giving you our take on on us watching the movie, like we do when we chat after we see something in the theater together. Uh, but there's so again. And that's, it's funny, like you said that the the humor the humor resetting that's a big thing that takes place throughout like, because you constantly see like something gets creepy, gets pulled back, and then gets a little bit more creepy. And it's it's almost like when you're doing a stretch, and then you relieve the stretch, and then you do the stretch so you can go a little bit further. Yep. And it it, it lets you get through it. That's that's this whole movie. <laughs> yeah. And it's really like, man, that was. I'm glad you said that. That was. <laughs> that's really funny. Like that's exactly it. 
Like that's what that's one of the reasons that makes this thing really great. Yeah, that's what this is. Is it's just it's a constant climb to this peak of oh, everything is. It feels like my nerves are on fire with how awkward or creepy or horrifying or cringy these things are. But you keep having little like you slap the ice pack on it for a second and then you take it back off and you're on fire again. <laughs> one one of the things that's funny to me: how unique is every character in this movie? In what way? I they just I don't know. They, I feel like nobody blends together. Like they're all. I I notice it here how different everybody is. Yeah, the, it didn't feel well of the main cast. Yeah. Uh, yes, no, there was oh, Yeah, there's the main cast, and then there's the rich white assholes <laughs> like, yes. from later on. Because the idea is that they are literally all the same people, right. despite having the slightest differentiations to make it worthwhile to have the conversation several different times. Because the conversations keep ending the same way, even though they take place in a different way. Right. Um, but yeah, no, like, of, you know, Chris, Rod, and the entirety of the Armitage family... Yes, they all have little connective tissue between them that show why they're all linked together, but more than enough separation that none of them feels redundant. Right, and they and it's funny like they do. It's a really good job because each time a person's on the screen, I'm excited to see them and excited to see where like what's going to happen with this character. And then when we move on, I'm a little bit sad that that one's gone. But then the next one comes in, I'm like, ooh, okay, what do you got for me? And it's all. It, there's just so much crazy stuff that happens in this, but again, we're not into spoilers yet. But you get you get actors that that speak a lot, and you have these this really fantastic dialogue throughout like their scenes, and then you'll get a scene of somebody who's not really talking much and just staring at the camera, and that works too. And yeah. they sell it really well. There's a lot of there's a lot of shots like that that are just like just a straight up shot of someone's face, and it's just pure emotion. And the motion the motion is usually terror. <laughs> So, I had a note about that, and we could dabble in it now if you want, but I think it'd be better, even better uh, on the other side of the spoiler veil. Okay. Um, well, hang on. Before you get into that, is, is there anything that you want to get into before spoilers? Because we could just go there. I mean, there's things that we can do, but... We're an hour and 12 been... minutes in. Go see the movie if you haven't seen it already. It's been over a year. How about I... that? Good? Yeah. What scene are you talking about? <laughs> Well, no, not one scene, but something that I notice as being key to why this movie works is the face acting, the mm -hmm. facial acting in this movie is crucially important and is on point start to finish. And even just kind of above and beyond that to get a little bit more 50,000 foot view, um, the importance of faces in this movie and what they represent Um the face acting is incredible. It, it <laughs> really is. Like, especially with, like, since we're, guys, remember, we're post-spoilers. Once we realize that the only other black people in the story are all replaced with white people brains. Yeah. And you watch this unsettling range of emotions that go across their face as it looks like they're chewing on every word before they deliver it, and mm -hmm. the, there's these vacant stares, and a tear always seems on the horizon, or is streaming down their faces, and it's, you know, the idea of, like, you know, what you'd expect when, like, there's an alien, in per like, inhabiting someone's body, and, like, right. smiles, like, now is the time that I smile to make sure that you are not uncomfortable, and then you smile, and it's this manic fucking grin on their face. Yeah. Oh and man. It's like that how important all of that is. But even on the more subtle stuff, like in the conversations where um and I'm gonna keep forgetting all these names, where Rose is trying to comfort Chris and there's the little smiles of the little this and that where it's like everything is supposed to be assuring and reassuring and and comforting him because the last thing she needs is him trying to leave as they're going through this whole thing to capture him, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> all those little things um, were so crucially important to how this all works in setting tone, in making you uncomfortable because Chris is a proxy for all of us, right? Where right. everyone's trying to 
keep him from being uncomfortable, even though everything they do, do is making him uncomfortable in some way. Yeah. And that's exactly what's happening to us is everything, every choice that's made. And this is why, honestly, even if it didn't win Best Picture, it wouldn't have not have been crazy for Jordan Peele to have won Best Director because every choice he made from start to finish in this movie is made with the intention of making the audience uncomfortable. Yeah. But at the same time, trying to walk the line between you being uncomfortable and uncomfortable because he doesn't want you to walk out of the room and he wants you to just soak in this uncomfort, discomfort. So, yeah. now, okay, here's the discomfort and I'll pull it back so that you're on board. And, oh, and it's back again. Every yeah. little thing, there's so many little things that I didn't even pick up on the first time that I watched it that I noticed the second time around that are like, Ah, there is, so is all, everything you're doing is trying to drive me insane, even though you don't want me to leave. So well done. So well done. Uh, what you were talking about before, like the characters that were like, it, it's like they're they're struggling inside. Like there's a like the uh, the the grandmother's character, the who's also like the housemaid. She's you can see the character stuck inside trying to come out. Like, how yeah. did you do that? Like, that was yeah. really, really good. And then, like, you are a real life human, and you're doing a really good job of playing like 1.5 people, <laughs> right? Which is just like, wow, <laughs> that was really good. There's... Also, there was a really fucked up line when they introduced her that I did not pick up on the first time I saw it, but knowing what the truth was the second time I saw it, I was like, wow, that's really creepy. Um, when they first give him the tour of the house mm-hmm. and the father, uh, was it, was it Brad? Was that his name? Dean, sorry, Brad is the name of the actor. Dean Armitage, when he's yeah. walking through the house and he goes into the kitchen and he says, um, you know, oh, uh, what was the, the maid's name? Fuck. Uh, Georgina keeps the kitchen spotless. Uh, it was, you know, my grandmother loved this kitchen so much. You keep a little piece of her in here. And I'm yeah. like, oh no, she's the little piece. Uh, yeah, that's that's funny. That is a that is a thing that you would not. He that's this is actually important. That is a that's a thing you don't know the first time you're watching it. That is a that is there for you the second time, which is great. Yes, um, I got it and I hated it. And I, loved I it. I pride myself on figuring out movies way too early. It is a blessing and a curse. Yep. I did not know where this was going until a decent way through. Yeah, and I was really happy about that. Yeah. I mean, I can't remember exactly because it, it was a year ago. Um, I know I figured it out before we got there. Yeah. But I don't remember at what point. I don't. It wasn't like super early, but like. Right. I don't uh, remember when it was. I figured it out. I'm with you. That that's but that's that's awesome because I love I love being I love trying to figure it out and then you, I, it, this is like one of those things where you like you kind of get it probably like right before it happens or like a little bit early right, like not too close to when it happens but like you know getting in there and then like when it does you're like oh like yes like i got it (laughs) kind of thing which is also good well and once i picked up on that line about her yeah um which like my 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 skin crawl um i reflected back and realized there was a line a little earlier um that was in the same vein um but i it just it didn't have the same weight to it but it was basically saying the same thing when uh, Chris and Rose are driving up the driveway and you see the groundskeeper mm-hmm. who is the grandfather yeah. um, out raking or whatever he was doing and she says uh, you know oh I know what you're thinking you know we hired them to take care of my grandparents but when we lost them we just couldn't let them go uh, and it's the same thing just not as effective in uh, out as the thing about the grandmother a little piece of her but like it's like oh god that's so creepy Man, so there's this this note that I have here about like how there's everybody's creepy like at some point and then they get they they again they come, they step back off of it which is what you're like basically what you were saying before about like okay make, so make you uncomfortable take a step back make you more uncomfortable they are creepy then they are creepier then they are creepiest and it's just like there's certain times where it's just like holy crap. What is going on? <laughs> and it's it's really good. And that's I feel like there's a, the perfect example of that is um the Jim Jim Hudson, who is uh the actor is Steven Root. Oh yeah. That that, that, that guy's a great actor. He plays so many ridiculous characters. I love him. 
but the this is so there's let, let's jump to this there's two scenes in the movie the, the two scariest scenes in the movie to me the two creepiest things one is the silent auction that is terrifying and especially what, with like the kind of gothic score building up behind yeah. it so it's it's absolutely horrifying and then like as it gets as it goes and goes and goes the the final bid is really the nail in the coffin that makes it just add like just like <laughs> when it's him and he puts it up after you're like oh this is the only person this is the only normal person <laughs> and he just doesn't see what's going on because he's blind not the case <laughs> well I actually the way I experienced it was like he was the only person that he that that he connected with at the party yeah and I was like, oh, that's nice. That's one person who's not super creepy, although even there, it was less stated than a lot of the other cliches and stereotypes. You get interaction between white and black people, but um, he, the character is literally blind because, and the reason that he connects with them is he's the person who says, oh, I don't see color. Yeah. He never says it that way in the movie, but that's what he's doing there. Like, that's yeah. the whole point of his character. Yeah. Right, like, uh, and so it, like, I did. I was like, oh, you know, I remember watching the scene, and I was like, oh, that's nice. He finally found someone who can talk to, and it's it's someone who has their own, you know, quote unquote, difference from society, right? You right. know, they, they, he can't see. You know, it's not the same as being a black person, but they each have their own little struggle. Yeah, you know, we're not going to argue who has it worse, right? But right. you know, it's like that's their connection point, and then it's like. Nope, he's just as bad as the rest of them. He's going to steal his body and put his brain in it. Great, oh fantastic. So that, <laughs> so that that silent auction is the is the second creepiest thing in the movie, in my opinion. Can you guess what is the creepiest thing that happens in this movie? What is the most unsettling scene in this movie? I mean, I feel like the the the, the cheapy knockoff answer is going to the sunken place, but that's too easy. I'm going to say it's when. He wakes up and talks to him through the TV. Nope. Creepiest yeah. scene for me is Allison Williams eating Fruit Loops. That was absolutely <laughs> infuriating and terrifying. <laughs> yeah, no, they definitely did it to a certain purpose. Once you realize just how much of a fucking psychopath she is, like, You're like oh, she's crazy too. Oh, she's the craziest. <laughs> whole different level of crazy. Also, there was definitely a lot of branding and imaging going on there with. The precision she was doing all of that with, uh -huh. and what she's wearing, and her hair, and yeah. the gun that she ultimately ends up choosing, there's a lot of symbolism behind that. Uh -huh. The whole and thing is just unsettling. Good. Yeah, it also and it all stems from that that first crunch of the fruit loop. <laughs> yeah. just like, oh. <laughs> some serious psycho shit going on. Oh man, that was just that was brutal. But uh, the, yeah, that's that was my uh, that's my second. That, that sorry, that is the the creepiest part of it for me. There is now 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 taking it back to slightly like this is before all hell breaks loose and everybody's the worst. Uh, <laughs> the the charger being unplugged from his phone constantly. That was another one that made me extremely uncomfortable because it's starting to get you paranoid because he's getting paranoid and you understand why he's getting paranoid. And I'm just like, oh, uh, hmm, uh, why is your phone unplugged? Uh, what's going on? These people definitely did this to you. <laughs> it's just, and it, like, you're, it's snowballing in my head as the viewer. Well, it's great because I brought it up and we've already touched on it a bit the idea of just constant being uncomfortable and unsettled. Yeah. And I found, especially right on the back of, I was watching it like, it was either a day or two after we. We saw Annihilation. It reminded me of the same thing. It's just I felt constantly uncomfortable along the same way that I did with Annihilation once they entered the Shimmer, right? Where, and it's all done on purpose. Like you're meant to be, and it's this, it's this amazing tapestry of things that they've come up with to make you uncomfortable. It's mm -hmm. visually, emotionally, uh, the, even just the audio. Like there's. The score itself, right, there's some dramatic and melancholy stuff that's going on that you feel it viscerally, but there was, at, not throughout the whole movie, but at certain times I noticed there's this buzzing yeah. sound 
mm-hmm. that's played that you almost feel more than you hear. Like that nagging. Oh, you feel it because when you have a surround sound system and the bass is right next to your chair, yeah, you definitely feel it. <laughs> I know. It was the same thing. I was watching it in the basement with the projector, and I have the surround sound there, and you feel this more than you hear this buzzing sound that's supposed to simulate, and it does simulate that crawling hair on the back of your neck. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like for sure. something is wrong. And I don't know what it is because it was being played at times where the sticks were pretty low. Because mm-hmm. like the first time I really took notice of it was when he's first getting to the house and being introduced to them and stuff like that. It starts to it's just there. It's this nagging thing yeah. that you can't put your finger on. Ugh. Oh man, I want to go rewatch this. It's, so it's good. The thing is, seeing it again, even knowing where it was all going, uh, it's still a creepy fucking movie, man. Oh, yeah, 100%. So there's um, – I actually only have three other notes. And oh, I still have a few. I, I'll, I'll, let, me, let me run through these and then we can I, – I might touch on some of yours. But uh, the one thing that like it was – the first time that like I, I – after like you get to the end of the movie and like you play back certain things that happen and you go, oh, my God, that's great. Like when the – when they get pulled over after the flying deer. Comes Wait, first across. of all, I have a note in all caps about that. It's just a one-off note, but that motherfucking deer was motherfucking flying. Yeah. That was also, that that was the scene that made me jump the most. Yeah. Because that was, that was abrupt. I felt like I was in an actual car crash with the deer. Yeah, it was terrifying. That was almost as, like, audibly shocking as some of the gunshots in Dunkirk. Yeah, that was it. Was that was rough, and it was also very, very loud and scary. <laughs> so, but all right. So after that, the cop is there, and they're talking to the cop, and he wants to see Chris's ID, and um, what's her name? She's getting all all defensive Rose. about it. Rose is getting all defensive about it, and it's it's because she doesn't want anybody knowing <laughs> the identification of this guy, and you don't know that at the time, and you're like. Oh, this guy's such an asshole, and you're like on her side, and then you're like, and then you feel really, really dirty later on when you're like, oh, she's the worst. <laughs> yeah, because at the time you're like, oh, this is shitty, racist cop, small town, right? Black guy, white cop, you know. Yeah. Oh, it's that's nice that the that the girlfriend's defending him and all this sort of stuff. Like, the, you know, it's almost almost the way it all walks down and de-escalated is almost heartwarming, and then it's like. No, it's not heartwarming. It's I just got stabbed in the heart with a knife because yeah. she's trying to execute the perfect crime. Oh my god! It was which I guess there's crime. kind of a whole internal tone of that where it's black people have been going missing and no one's taking notice. Like that's fucked up. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. So that so that scene that was that was one thing that I wanted to make sure that we brought up. The other one is um, the TSA guy. <laughs> Rob. How great is Rob? Rob. Rob or Rod? Rod with a Rod D. Rod with a D. How great is his that character? Is, his name is Rodney, I think so. He was hysterical. He is the he is every audience member that is yelling at the screen, but he's in yeah. the movie, and it's so good, and it's so well done. Oh my god, you're about to be a motherfucking sex slave. And he saves the day, and that's oh, the, that's the best part is that he saves the day. <laughs> I love that. Like yeah, like, like that, that, that he called a lot of it. Like they were making him a sex slave, but they were gonna make him a slave. Like it's... yeah, <laughs> when he's when he's at the police station and he's trying to explain all this stuff and he's going on and on and he thinks that they're listening to him and that they're really into it. And he's just like completely let down when they start laughing at him. I was heartbroken. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, he's got the dog there, like you know, he's like so earnest, like oh, trying to save my friend, man. Like he is so funny. It's just so good. One of the one of the best characters, and then the other piece to this puzzle is so. Whereas he's the best character, one of the worst characters is freaking. Um, his he's got three names. The actor, uh, Jones? yeah, terrifying. Yeah, uh, he's creepy as fuck as always. That uh, well, not scary. as always. It's funny. I was thinking about it because when we did three billboards, yeah, I talked about how oh, it's kind of cool. This is like the year of Caleb Landry Jones because he was in. Three billboards, he was in Get Out, and he was in American Made. And I was thinking about it more today before we recorded, and I was like, you could draw 
a Venn diagram of the three characters he played this year, where on the one side, you have an intelligent, reasonable guy who he played in uh, Three Billboards as we talked into. And then on this other side, we have really creepy, really don't want to be in a dark alley with this guy is the character he played in American Made. And where those two circles intersect is his character from this movie because he's clearly very smart and educated, but he's so fucking creepy. Oh my God, he's the worst. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's terrifying, and he he really does a good job of making you feel uncomfortable. There's a, it's actually just one of, again referencing that that um, honest trailers for the Oscars. The he called you know how I don't know if you you've seen enough of them to know that he renames the movie at the end, like he just he gives it a different title that yeah, yeah. captures everything that he's been saying before. For three billboards, it was three racists inside Ebbing, Missouri. <laughs> it, was, it was the title, but uh, just go watch that. Um, yeah, he's. I, you know, he's just a weird. He's a weird guy in general, but it's he does have that. The kid's got range. Yeah. And when, when he's at that table and like there, and he's getting drunker and drunker, and and more and more likely to be violent outwardly, yeah, instead and of, getting uh, aggressive. It's ew, it is it is again extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> also, the only time that the facade really slips into some of the overt racial things that you'll hear people say, you know, not, not like no one dropped an N word or anything like that. But he's like, he starts getting into the whole thing with the, with your physical structure and your this and that. Yeah. And it's like, you know, you have certain advantages and this and that. It's like, okay, dude, pump the brakes. Like what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. And there's, there's one other scene. Um, and that, that kind of leads into like the last part of like my notes here is the, so when, when he, when he finally realizes what's going on, that scene is again another heartbreaking scene where he's like, "Give me the keys, like throw me the keys," yeah. and he's he's freaking out because he's saying it over and over again, but he already knows where this is going. Because it's, it's like the like all the walls are closing in around him, and yeah. he still sees a doorway, and he wants but he's surrounded to by a pack can, of wolves. He wants to believe he can walk out of that doorway, even though he knows the second he reaches for it, it's gonna slam close. Yeah. Oh man, that scene is uh, as. A lot of the scenes are uncomfortable, but that one is just you. He's helpless, and you're yeah. Helpless. It's sad. It's like you're you're there too. It's like, oh, I don't yeah. want to be that uh, man. <laughs> and, and they just like it's like they're circling him, and then that's it's just. <laughs> then they it's got funny said that because I actually had a note about that too. That they this family is the perfect pack of hunters. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they are. Because you have. Her as this wolf in sheep's clothing, right? right? Where everything is sweet and she's loving and caring and understanding, and you know she's the one who's, she, you know, she's playing the good cop, right? Where oh my family, you know, just I'm so sorry about them, like that's you know, or you know, and all this stuff, and it's like okay, and then you got you know the dad who is trying to seem well intentioned, it seems, even though it's so ridiculous and put on like the fact that we actually have to hear like the i would have voted for barack obama joke like three times in the movie it's like it's like dude you're trying way too hard and then you have the mother who you can't really get a read on her where she's kind of motherly but definitely has a problem with boundaries Uh, and also she can hypnotize apparently anyone with just a cup of tea and she's gonna make sure that psychologically you're bound before they get ready to physically bind you and then you got this fucking creepy alpha in the creepy son, and yep. all of them play off each other perfectly. In that, just like you said, as they're all just closing around him, and it just feels inevitable. Yeah. Oh man, that's that's a great scene. But like, they, there's the the one point in that scene where he, where he just like he like he's like asking for the keys, but he like kind of puts his hand down, and he's just like because he knows they're not coming. Mm-hmm. And they're just like, uh huh. Like I, I understand. I also know this isn't coming, but I don't. It's. T- I still don't want it to happen. <laughs> <laughs> really well done. What else you got? Um. Well, I was just. I mentioned before. I think. I think it was before we did the spoilers. I completely forgot about that first scene where. Oh yeah, the opening of the movie. Guy gets 
taken out on the street, which I guess was uh, Jeremy, the brother. Um, mm-hmm. You never see him because he's got his mask on, but right. there's a line by the Stephen Root character where he says, when he's once the veil has been lifted on them and he's talking to him through the TV and he says, you know, you got lucky, you know, Rose I've heard is, you know, kind of gentle as opposed to her brother Jeremy, who's a little bit more direct. Yeah. And that's when you realize, oh, that was Jeremy who, like, chokes out that guy on the street. Mm-hmm. And at first I was like, wow, this is fucking real? Watching that scene, like, this is really fucking fucked up. Like, that poor guy wasn't doing anything to anybody. Right. And he just gets choked out and thrown into shrunk. But then I had to rewind the scene and watch it again because – when he gets thrown in the trunk, it's very clearly no longer a human being <laughs> and it's a ridiculously rigid prop. <laughs> and it's like, because you can see him pick it up and the body is stiff as a board and also probably went from weighing 150 pounds to weighing like 15 pounds. Oh my God, that's really funny. <laughs> and he's trying to like, stuff um, it in the trunk and it's very clearly no longer a human body anymore. <laughs> I'll have to watch for that next time. Like, I was laughing pretty hard at what was admittedly a very fucked up scene. Yeah, you're, was like, you're watching it and it ends and you're like, wait a minute. I, mean, I had to rewind this. <laughs> I just see there. That's great. Um, and something else I had was, how much of Key and Peele did you watch? Not much. I watched basically the whole show. I'm sure I missed an episode or two, but like I, I pretty much saw the whole thing. Okay. This... In some ways, this movie does feel like a very extended skit from Key and Peele that's way darker than the show got frequently. I mean, we get there once in a while. That makes sense. But obviously, there's way more to it than that. It's not a Hollywood movie. There's a lot going on. Yeah. Um, and it was worth it was worth watching. Well, you, you're up. seeing the style of one of the of half the creators. Yeah. Well, but that's the thing is, I didn't feel like the whole movie felt that way. But there were, or at least there was a certain few things that felt very key and peel. Mm-hmm. Um, the scene where the, the groundskeeper runs at him and oh then God. breaks off and makes a hard left turn. Yep. That is straight out of the key and peel playbook. <laughs> just getting his exercise in. Yeah. that yeah. was. Oh. Well, it was funny him saying it later on, but just the thing where it's like this super rising tension is this guy is coming at you in a dead sprint and then he just yep. turns to the left and he just disappears and is no longer a threat. That is 100% key and peel. Some of the creepy stuff, like like when the grandmother uh, housekeeper was like crying, or when he's crying and the tears are just so dramatically streaming down his face, that's some key and peel shit. Um, some of the audio cues to this <laughs> were the, in the same way that they did. They played around with sound and music in that show in some ways that I found really entertaining, including several times where they incorporated songs from other media um and especially in, uh, you know, it's weird that i keep getting able to bring it up but this is a real reason this isn't me drawing weird parallels they actively used music from mass effect 2 and 3 several times in the show really? like the first time i heard it in the show i was like what is that what i think it is and I, <laughs> it up and I was like yeah that's 100 percent ripped out of the game itself which I think it's kind of cool when something like that is. <laughs> and there's other things from movies and TV shows that pop up in that way too, but for whatever reason, that stuck with me more. Um, but yeah, there's just some weird, ridiculous things that I noticed in this movie that were little affectations that fit from the style of the show. It's awesome. I would like to go back and watch. It was a really good show. I was I was say, I've only seen some, and I really yeah, enjoyed what I saw. When they announced that the, the final season was going to be the final season. Mm. It caught me by surprise. I felt like they still had a lot more to do. Yeah. Man, maybe it'll come back at some point. Well, I, I would have liked to see Keegan Michael Key pop up and even a little cameo thing in this. You know what I mean? Right. No, yeah, 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 that would like be cool. The first guy who got kidnapped. You know what I mean? That's true. I it, Also, I don't know. I Like... It's Key and Peel, right? Like those are like the name. Make if they're trying to make their own names like separated a little bit. I could see, you know what? A good idea would be to not bring him in at all. I don't know. I think something like that where it's he's in a self-contained three-minute scene. Yeah. As opposed, and that's exactly the type of thing where he's just like kind of cracking, like, nope, not today. It's going to be me, you know. Like right. I've seen him do that exact thing before. You know what I mean? Like 
it, it would have been perfect. You would have never seen him again in the rest of the whole movie. You know what I mean? Like, it wouldn't have mattered. Yeah. Oh, man. What was it? It was, it was a good one. And really happy that he won that Oscar. Yeah, me too. It's really awesome stuff. You got anything else? No, I mean, I'm curious to see where he goes next because I've yeah. seen him attached to a couple of projects that look like they haven't panned out. Um, oh, really? There was, he was, there was a long time where he, he was attached to um, this movie, was it um, Akira? Uh, if it was, I think it was an anime or something like that. Okay. That, they, that he was supposedly going to make. And it, like, fell through, so I, I don't know what, like, what I'm looking right now. Like, it looks like, oh, it looks like he's got a TV show coming out this year. Hmm. Oh, I just saw a commercial for this today, actually. I didn't realize he was attached to this. Um, the last OG, it's uh, Tracy Morgan, I think, is, like, it's, uh, I, I saw a commercial, and I saw um, Tracy Morgan and Tiffany Haddish are, like, Two of the main stars. Oh, cool. Uh, it looks like it's also got Cedric the Entertainer, and I don't really recognize anyone else on the main cast list, but uh, it says that he created the show, I guess, and he's writing for it, so. Nice. Oh, well, well, we'll have to keep our, uh, our eyes and ears out for any more Jordan Peele. Yeah, it looks like that's the only thing that he's got. Uh, oh, I guess he's going to be in a, he's going to be doing a Twilight Zone thing. That's a cool. miniseries. Nice. But yeah, I'm curious to see what he picks next because it seemed like that was like a big project that, uh, that Akira thing, which I, I don't know much about, but I heard a lot of people talk about it and a lot of people seem to know it. So um, something of a big deal. So, uh, But it looks like that project had fallen through. So I'm not really sure mm-hmm. what his next big thing is going to be yet, but I'm curious to see. Yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to see. Well, that's it for episode 37 of Flicks in the Six. Hope you enjoyed it. If you want to keep the conversation going, I'm at AEJ Costanzo on Twitter and Instagram, and Al is at Alessandro B1187. Check back next week for more movie and beer goodness. And until then, cheers.